I'm Wilson Perrin, uh, currently the Deputy Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. And I uh, have known uh, Senator Fowler for many, many years, uh, from my high school years and from his years on the uh, Calvin County Board of Education. So I have known him and I've uh, followed his uh, political career and his uh, public servant, uh, service uh, to the county and also the state of Maryland from the, when it's president on the Board of Education in Calvert County to county commissioner starting from 70 to uh, 1982 and as a senator uh, serving uh, this region uh, from 1983 to 1994. Now this was a period of transition for Calvert County. Calvert County was one of the uh, poorest counties uh, in the state, and uh, Senator Fowler, over the many years, in his role as a pre uh, president of the Board of Education, subsequently president of the commissioners, set, he had the vision to set the direction for Calvert County. Uh, that is still the direction that we have today. So it's really an honor to be able to spend some time reflecting uh, with Senator Fowler about his leadership and his accomplishments over all those years. It's ironic, but Wilson and I have had similar uh, experiences in our public office. Uh, I went to him and asked him to serve on the uh, uh, local board of education. Yeah. I'd started on the board of education, was president. Well, appointments in those days were six years. Oh, okay. And uh, the last four years I served as president. And uh, we needed somebody of his caliber on the Board of Education because you, know, you can see things coming down the road now and you want to make sure you got people in the right place to, to handle it. <coughs> education was one of our number one targets and uh, so he accepted. Then later I got him to serve on the State Board of Education because we hadn't had a representative that I could remember of my lifetime and yet uh, he was a perfect candidate. So that worked out. And it turned out that he was a big help to me when we got up there. Senator Fowler, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great, thank Good. you. Good. Um, and I've, I've known you for many, many years. I, uh, I first came in contact with you when you were on the Board of Education. Now, your commitment spans decades in Calvert County. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you were president of the Board of Education um, at a time when it was, it was a challenge for well, education in Calvert County. There were a lot of things going on. Uh, just for the record, I graduated in 1968, so you were president of the board at the time that I graduated. Uh, tell me about your, your, uh, your years on the Board of Education. Uh, my years uh, on the Board of Education were truly a joy for me. Uh, it came in a time when we had some very challenging uh, issues to face. But uh, we were very fortunate we had the uh, superintendent of school at that time was Morris Dunkel. And he was, uh, was well-equipped intellectually, but he also uh, had the sensitivity uh, of knowing when to hold and when to fold. And uh, you recall that uh, on about this time, we were under the gun to integrate all the schools in Colbert County, which was long overdue. And uh, I was president of the board when that occurred. But uh, through the guidance and the, uh, the know-how and the temperament uh, of uh, Morris Dunkel, uh, we were able to succeed in that completely without one racial incident whatsoever. And uh, I thought that was a very, uh, very proper way to do it obviously, and uh, overwhelmed with the success that we had in doing that. And uh, it, uh, it should have happened a couple of hundred years sooner, but uh, better late than never, I guess. But uh, along with that, uh, the one thing that was always troubling with me on the Board of Education, we never, we were always lacking funds. We couldn't pay teachers a decent salary. Our turnover rate in Colbert County was probably the highest in the state. I recall one year we had a 40% turnover in the teachers. That's, uh, that's almost disaster. 
But what was happening, the uh, young teachers would get out of college and they'd get certified and they'd come to Colbert County because there were plenty of job openings here for them. And uh, uh, they'd work for two or three years, garner up some experience, and then they'd move on to the larger, more wealthy counties uh, like Prince George and Montgomery and uh, Anne Arundel County. And uh, we would we would have to really fight. In fact, there was times when, uh, uh, in hiring teachers, that you just feel them. If they were warm, you'd hire them because you had to have had to fill the spots. There were times when we were not able to fill all the teaching spots. We had to use uh, substitute people in to do that. Uh, our county at that time was uh, uh, the second poorest county in the state of Maryland, and. Uh, our educational system wasn't a whole lot better. That's not to say that we didn't have a lot of successful people that went through the system here. We've had some very notable people that did well. Uh, professors at uh, John Hopkins University in the service during World War II, there were uh, colonels and there were all kind of people that uh, went through the system that did quite well. and. Uh, Anyway, the, uh, the, the thing that was troubling to me was the lack of funds. Uh, and I recall one year, and it, it's kind of a funny story, I recall one year that uh, Mr. Dunkel called me on the phone and he was desperate. It is now uh, the first week in June and the county commissioners at that time had not approved the budget. Uh, there, was no, uh, there was no requirement for them to have a certain date in which to meet a deadline on the budget. So uh, they, uh, they weren't in any hurry, and it, uh, it was reached a point where we couldn't get contracts signed to the teachers because we didn't know what the salary was going to be. And uh, he was desperate, and he told me, he said, is there anything you, you can do? And I said, uh, like, this is, uh, they only met on Tuesdays for a little while in those days. And uh, I said, well, let me, uh, let me see if I can get a hold of a few of the commissioners and talk with them. At that time, we only had three commissioners, which wasn't a bad system, quite frankly. It worked good. So uh, I visited uh, two of the three commissioners. I couldn't find the third one because the third one was uh, uh, out of the county that day. But the president of the board, when I explained to him how dire it was and how desperate we were to get these contracts signed, we're losing teachers. Uh, is there any way you can give me a commitment of what you're going to do so I can relay that back to uh, Mr. Dunkel and we can get on with the work at head? So uh, he finally, after a considerable time, and I heard the story loud and clear, well, you know, we're spending too much money in education. Uh, I only went to the fifth grade in school, and I've been very successful. Well, he was also very lucky. and. Uh, a uh, wonderful person. Uh, I wouldn't in any way try to denigrate him and, and uh, downsize his importance, but uh, that was the attitude in those days. Education was not a priority, not a serious consideration in some of our leadership. But anyway, he finally, after a considerable uh, conversation with him, he wrote a figure down on a piece of paper. He said, if you can get one more commission to agree to this, that's what we'll do. So. I get on my horse now. I got in my car and I drove down to the other commissioners in the, in the first district. I called his wife and said, uh, he's out on a tractor, but said, you come on down, he'll, he'll talk to you. So I went down, had a nice talk with him and explained to him. And when I showed him the figure, he said, oh, that, that, that figure's wrong. We didn't agree to that much. And I said, well, that's the, uh, that's the figure that your colleague gave me, the president board gave me. And he said, if I could get someone else to agree with that, that would be the, that would be the finality of the budget. So uh, after a considerable conversation, I said, well, there's one thing I'm not going to do in my life if I, if I know. I'm not going to misrepresent the facts. I'm telling you, that's what he wrote down. That's his handwriting. So then he agreed. I went back to the superintendent of schools at that time and told him, two people that had agreed to it. Now, what we did was illegal, 
but we didn't have a choice because you know you have to hold public hearings, as you well know. Article 25 is very defined on what you have to do in order to meet the uh, the, the the covenants of the law, and uh, so we uh, we we finally got that settled down anyway. Well, we don't have a choice, so we signed contracts. We did not have an official document saying this is going to be your budget for the year. And uh, that was the year that we lost 40% of our teachers because it was so, uh, it was so, so indefinite and they felt insecure. But, uh, we really didn't have a choice. Uh, we had to do something. But uh, that, it, it's, uh, it was a serious story, but I thought it had a little bit of levity in it, you know, the way, <laughs> the way it was. <laughs> uh, but, but it demonstrates your leadership not only in when, when its schools were integrated. And I remember uh, at my graduation, you were the, the speaker at my graduation, and the motivating message you have about uh, you can make a difference. And, and, and you also encouraged us to come back to Calvert County, wherever you went to come back to Calvert County and make a difference in Calvert County. Um, but um, your leadership in, in, on the school board level, there was a connection with the school board and the state. Uh, years later, when I, when you you uh, supported me and and, and uh, was successful in getting me appointed to the school board, I also uh, served uh, in the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. And as I was researching the history, I saw that you also served on that uh, executive committee there. So tell me about your second poorest county in in in, in the state. Uh, you not only did uh, demonstrated leadership here, but you also uh, participated at the state level in, in Boards of Education Association. I uh, I recall so uh, so vividly uh, of serving on the uh, uh, Maryland Association of Boards of Education. In fact, I had uh, reached the plateau of uh, first vice president. I would have been president the next year. I, uh, I declined that because uh, all during this uh, period of time I was on the Board of Education, I had a, a lot of affection for the educational system and I wanted it to improve. And in, in doing so, uh, you, you really needed to, uh, I thought at that time, and I really wasn't that uh, inclined to become a politician. But I felt that if you wanted people to listen to you, you had to have a station, you had to have a base from which you voiced your opinion and your plans and your vision. So I decided I'd run for county commissioner. That's the one thing that, that uh, got me moving in there. And I told them regretfully up there that I would decline the presidency of the Maryland Association of Boards of Education because of the reasons I've just mentioned, that I was interested in politics. I wanted to get into the situation where I could help to improve education, improve health, bring recreation to the county, strong public safety, and uh, certainly uh, the love of my life, one of the loves of my life, was the Patuxent River. Yeah. At that time, it was in decline, and I wanted to make sure that I had, uh, I had some uh, uh, authority behind me when I spoke in order to try to bring restoration back to that very productive body of water. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, the, the uh, Board of Education was, uh, was a great experience and serving on the Navy was also a great experience. I learned a lot and it was just uh, a highlight of my life. It really, it, it kind of helped to mold me for the future that was shorter to come. But I will never forget that, uh, that uh, integration schools. Uh, we, had, we had some real characters in this county. Still do, but <laughs> and most of them had passed away by then. I had more threats on the telephone. Wilson, you would not believe. I got so I left the phone off the hook at night time when I go to bed. Oh man, they were adamant. They're, they're most of them the ones started their private school. Uh, so tell, tell me a little bit about uh, this 
I guess you were campaigning in 69, 70. To, to yeah. Fall, of course, to really, really got rolled in the early part of 70. Yeah. It was it different in those days. You didn't start two years ahead of time. You right. know. <clears throat> but at any rate, uh, uh, we think back to the to the days on the Board of Education, and of course, the one overriding factor in my life was that I had a uh, very affectionate and abiding interest in Colbert County and what it was going to be like down the road. Uh, that experience on the Board of Education uh, really taught me and helped to build the kind of leadership within me that uh, I needed to actually to meet the task ahead. Uh, remembering now that Colbert County, as I mentioned earlier, was a poor county, a poor educational system. We had a hospital that was uh, barely meeting the needs of the other, doing the best they could under the circumstances. Uh, there were no recreational fields, uh, no softball fields, or basketball courts, or any of that. Uh, very, very limited opportunity for kids to uh, recreate other than on, on school property. And uh, so there were a lot of things. And then I could see the uh, I could see the bridge coming at Sullivan's Island. I could see the dualization being completed on Route 4. And uh, uh, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that uh, uh, when things happened like this, and then we were anticipating this a large sum of money coming in from uh, Baltimore Gas and Electric at that time. Uh, but um, all of those things kept going around in my mind. And, you know, somebody has got to step up to the plate and uh, kind of set the pace to set the compass, box the compass the way we want it, so that we can uh, meet the demands that are necessary for the county to be a good county and to provide the amenities. So it was all infrastructure that we were, we were thinking about. I figured, well, in order to do that, you've, you've got to, you got to be in the county commissioner's seat because after all, everything happening in Colbert County uh, doesn't happen unless the local board of county commissioners, I mean, unless it's a private organization. Uh, you need the support of the county commissioners. So I figured that's the place to be. So uh, I chose then to to file for county commissioner uh, with all of the uh, uh, what I like to think of was uh, sound vision uh, coming down the road. When I was elected, uh, elected it was not a real close election, and I was elected. And uh, at that time, your peers elected you as president, and I served for nine consecutive years as president of the board of county commissioners. But there are several things that I did in the very beginning when I became a county commissioner. First and foremost, I wanted a transparent government. Uh, no more executive meetings unless it was absolutely essential. And it was only, uh, uh, I think we had about 11 executive meetings uh, while I was president of the Board of County Commissioners because I wanted the public that elected me to know what was going on in our government. They didn't have to make an appointment to come in and see the county commission. They walked in, listened to a meeting as long as they wanted to and walk out. Uh, there was no restrictions whatsoever. And then another thing, and I may have mentioned this earlier in the uh, earlier part of the interview, was that uh, I also wanted to build a, uh, a help to build or, or set in place the things that would uh, that would be uh, well, I don't like to use the word moral, but I, I'd like to see government uh, gain, you know, some morality in terms of how they function and all. So uh, my first moves that I made, first and foremost, was to uh, talk with the other two commissioners and see if they had an objection to me bringing in a minister to open the. Mm -hmm. uh, public uh, meetings out with a prayer and Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, they were they were gung-ho, ready to go for it. Yeah. Two uh, very nice people to work with. 
And uh, so we started with that. And the other thing that I asked him to do was seriously uh, consider approving the uh, placement of some kind of re recording devices. We didn't have the fancy uh, TV stuff that they have now. And uh, uh, let's record those meetings so that, uh, uh, you know, for years to come. In other words, uh, record them for posterity so that anyone can come in here any time they want and request a meeting. They can listen verbatim to what was said and what went on in that meeting. And we succeeded in doing both of those. And I uh, always felt that that was very important because we all need a little bit of supervision. Uh, and uh, if you are too, uh, if you're too secluded, uh, you can become a little careless in what you do. But if you've got, uh, you know, 20,000 bosses watching you, yeah. it, it makes it, uh, it gives you the encouragement you need to, to, uh, to conduct yourself in a manner that uh, we would like to think would be a national trend so that, uh, you know, government by the people and other people for the people truly is, is present and uh, the right thing to do. So the, uh, that was the transition from the Board of Education to the uh, Board of County Commissioners. And uh, uh, one of the early things we did was to, uh, because at that time we had no subdivision regulations in the county, we had no uh, uh, very limited building inspection, and uh, all of the amenities that you'd need to attract people to the county uh, that didn't bring a wake of problems with them, uh, we were absent of. So uh, how do we do that? So we just shut down everything. We, uh, we declared, a, we held a public meeting, we did everything proper, and we uh, uh, put a moratorium on the subdivision of any land in Carver County whatsoever until such time as we could get a plan in place. And uh, that plan was in place uh, within about a year, and we opened the gate up again. And I really believe that that was, uh, uh, we had many people that helped us on that. It was about 400 people all together. And uh, we had professional planners that put it all together and put it in a book, and it was called the Pleasant Peninsula Plan. And that plan uh, was, uh, I think, one of the better moves we made because it kind of uh, set the stage, that plan kind of set the stage for the future of Crawford County. In other words, we were, we were, uh, we settled in 1654, and the theme of that is what do you want to be like in the year 2000, which is long past, yeah. but it was long ahead then. We're talking about 1970, 30 years later, and uh, it was, uh, it was a joy to be a part of that and to watch the kind of talent that we had in this county, bring them together. And we broke up in, uh, into commissions and they chose whatever commission they wanted to serve on, turned that plan in, and that, that, was, uh, that, was my, uh, that was my compass all the time I was in office, that plan. People in this county put this plan together and uh, uh, we're going to do all we possibly can to make sure that we adhere to it and not ignore that or in any way to uh, uh, indicate that this was a, just an exercise of futility. We wanted it to work, and uh, I believe it did work pretty well. It, it did. It, uh, quite frankly, the first comprehensive plan in Calvin County. And I also recall you leading that effort and the passion you had for looking beyond where we are, we were at the time, but looking out. 30 years, and in, not only in terms of zoning, but in terms of what do you want Calvin County to look like. And so I, I personally really appreciate you, your leadership in that area. Uh, in terms of commissioner, we, uh, when you were commissioner, the power plant, was, the nuclear power plant was, was under construction. The only nuclear power plant in the state of Maryland, the only one basically in the area. Uh, Tell me about that ex experience that you that we have 100 percent support support or are people concerned about the uncertainty of, of, of nuclear power. Uh, 
clearly we worked through all those issues, but you were the one in the leadership seat when all that actually took place. Well, one of the exciting times uh, in our early uh, tour of duty as county commissioners was the uh, nuclear power plant, which was being uh, constructed by uh, Bowman Gas and Electric. And I recall the first public hearing I attended was uh, a hearing that had been challenged by uh, environmental groups, and uh, they were determined to stop that nuclear power plant. Uh, we had, uh, oh, 90 percent support locally here, but the opposition was coming from external forces. One lady from the Eastern Shore was one of the ring leaders, and uh, the uh, the uh, regulatory agency heard all of their all of their complaints and everything, and uh, uh, then ultimately they ruled in favor of the nuclear power plant. And we anticipated that happening, and knew we were going to have uh, the resources we need needed to go ahead and. Uh, uh, construct the, the different things that we needed, you know, uh, to, to make Colbert County a receptive place to come to, a pleasant place to live, and yet uh, to try to minimize the, the uh, uh, problems that sometimes are inherent with growth. And uh, uh, I think in large measure, with the help of many good people, we were able we were able to accomplish that. Our first budget in 1970, uh, this is astounding, was, if memory serves me correctly, was just a little over $4 million for the entire budget. And the first check that uh, I was presented from Baltimore Gas and Electric was for $7,500,000. So uh, almost twice what our, our budget was at that time. So we were able to uh, we were able to use that wisely because of the plan we'd put it in place, and uh, uh, everything worked out good at the nuclear power plant. It, it got off the first unit got off without a hitch, and so did the second unit a few years later, and uh, it enabled us to do exactly some of the things that we had in that plan. You know, we uh, started off with strong support of the hospital. Uh, they wanted to build a new hospital, and uh, at that time the uh, estimate for the new hospital was going to be about eight million dollars. And uh, as still is the case, any uh, bond issue like that has to be uh, approved through the legislature in Annapolis. Uh, so uh, the bond was set, the Senate at that time introduced the bill, I got the bond approved for eight million dollars. Now, a couple years later, when they got nearing the time to go to work on the hospital plans and everything, they had some uh, estimates that didn't agree with the bond. It was $12 million instead of $8 million, so we we're $4 million shy. And uh, the, uh, the authority at that time in Annapolis uh, simply said, you asked for $8 million, we approved $8 million. And, uh, you're going to build an $8 million hospital. That was a very abrupt way of doing it, but that's the way it was. And now, as you well know, uh, again, under Article 25, we don't have the authority to provide funds for private nonprofit organization. And the Carver Memorial Hospital, which was known as Carver County Hospital at the time, uh, was, uh, was no exception. There was no way we could give them the money. There was no way that we could loan them the money. It just was illegal to do so. And uh, so they were in a dilemma because now they're going to have to reduce the, the uh, quality of the hospital because they've got to meet these eight, $8 million uh, ceiling. And uh, I recall so well Fred Donovan, who's passed many years ago, he was this wonderful person. He was a great community person quiet but very uh, but very smart and served us well in uh, World War II. He was a commissioned officer in the Marine Corps 
and uh, he did a good job for us in World War II. Uh, but he and I had a nice conversation one time, and he said, you know, you've got to find a way to help us out. There's no other way we can get the money. We can't raise that kind of money. So time went on, and a light bulb went off in my mind and just said, you know, they're going to have a building left over up there. Once they build this new hospital, would it be possible for the county commissioners then to uh, lease that building for a long period of time, advance them the $4 million so they can go ahead and get the hospital built the way they want it to? And uh, so uh, uh, Judge Boyne has a brother who is passed now, who was a very bright attorney. His name was Lowell Boyne, and uh, I called him and talked with him personally on the phone. And I told him, I said, I didn't want the word to get out down here, but I do need a positive legal opinion. And I let him know what we were thinking about it, and he said, uh, he called me back, so a couple of days later he called me back, he'd done all the research, he said, you've got the green flag, you can do it. Yeah. Just do it right and you're okay. So we held a public hearing and ended up uh, leasing the old hospital for a, a period of years, I forgot the years now, 20 years or something like that, for four million dollars, with no intent of ever using that building <laughs> for anything significant. Uh, there were some county commissions that thought it should be converted into county office building, and uh, we fought that very hard. In fact, fought it so hard that it ended up in court. And uh, uh, again, my side was fortunate enough to win, uh, and uh, we went ahead and uh, ultimately, you know, what happened to the old hospital, it got demolished and was put in a uh, landfill. Uh, which was a good place for it. It didn't belong in the front of that hospital up there because when that land was purchased many years ago, the doctor uh, that had the vision for that, he saw that as a health community. That entire 56 acres at that time was to be used to, for health purposes only. The hospital, the health department, nursing home, whatever, needed to support the health community. And uh, that... Uh, that, that materialized quite well, but it didn't come without some uh, manipulating, and all of which was perfectly proper and legal, and we had very limited opposition to it, very limited opposition to it. And That's I recall... Good, good history of that, how we got that hospital. I remember the old one, and I remember the, the funding for the new one, and uh, again, your leadership to make that happen. Well, I had... Uh, I had uh, Dr. George Williams who was on there, and uh, he, uh, he, he was uh, really the spark for, uh, you know, the health. Anytime we had a health problem, we'd say, Doc, what do you think about this? And, uh, he'd always give you good, sound yeah. advice, and in most cases, we followed his advice. But uh, that was, a, that was a, a moment of success that has never had regrets. I recall uh, later on when they discussed the uh, the indebtedness and the uh, Board of County Commissioners at that time, you may have been on the board at that time, uh, but uh, at any rate, the hospital had asked them to excuse the indebtedness. Before I got on. Before you got on, okay. I remember that though. And they asked me uh, if I would if I would testify, you know, in favor of that. And so I went to the public hearing they had, and uh, uh, what had happened when uh, the, uh, they agreed, the majority of the board agreed to do it, and the minority of the board protested uh, excusing the debt. So they were in a dilemma, and my testimony was very short. I just simply said that, uh, you know, uh, there's nobody sitting up in your seat that doesn't want to see this hospital succeed. Nobody. You love that hospital. You want to do what's right. And uh, your attorney's already told you that you took action without having a public meeting like you should have. And so admitting you, you were wrong. Now, why don't you just, for the purpose and for the good of all concerned, why don't you just resolve to say uh, 
we made a mistake, we didn't do it properly, and uh, after thinking it over, we definitely want to help the hospital and get on with it. And uh, a number of other people testified, and after that they did change their mind and agreed to excuse the indebtedness. So, uh, but to see, the hospital was key. The hospital was key to the growth in the county because people coming here from X, Y, Z, uh, several things they're going to want to know. What kind of education system do you have in Crawford County? Uh, what about if my wife gets sick or one of my children gets sick? What kind of health facilities do you have? Uh, what's the crime rate in Crawford County? Do you have police down there to protect and take care of the people and keep the crime rate down? And all of these things is what they look at. And so that really, in a, uh, in a nutshell, was well, what we were trying to do. We were trying to build an infrastructure that would attract the kind of people that would be an asset to the county rather than to be a deficit. And uh, we right now have in this county some of the most talented people you'll find anywhere in the United States of America right here in Colbert County. And uh, I'm proud, of course, uh, I'm old fashioned. If I had my way, I'd like to go back to the old days, you know. <laughs> you knew everybody in the county, but uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's past tense. So uh, what we have to do is to, uh, is to be very neighborly and to provide the kind of uh, tender loving care and friendship that people expect when they move into a, a new neighborhood, a new community. And uh, the two more things I want to I want you to talk about that happened when you were a uh, county commissioner. One was that during the, the 70s, the, it, and, and uh, I mentioned this because we talked earlier about the, the Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation was created during the 70s, created in 73, at a time when um, we were building the infrastructure, state roads, dualizing. Uh, uh, Route 4, changing it from 416 to Route 4, if you recall, right. uh, building a bridge. Uh, and at that time, the first Secretary of uh, Transportation later became Governor, Governor Hughes. And I know he was a friend of yours, and, he, and you guys worked together when you later became Senator. But it was a time when, as you said, the, the second poorest county in the state, you're getting a lot of, needing a lot of resources. You had dollars coming in from the power plant. We, we were successful in getting that bridge connecting Calvert and St. Mary's County. Um, talk a little bit about that, because you were right in the middle of that. It was also, uh, you had the power plant coming in, later you had activity coming in on the naval base uh, across the, uh, the, on the St. Mary's side. Uh, but you were, you were a leader at that point, as a county commissioner, president, and there's a lot of that stuff was going on. It was a, it was a time of, uh, of uh, challenge for all of us. And uh, what we wanted to do, quite frankly, was to not become spendthrifts. We wanted to be as conservative as we could, but we also knew investments had to be made because like you mentioned, the bridge coming, the dualization of Route 4 and all. Uh, and uh, never in my wildest dreams that I ever think that I'd have the opportunity to serve with a governor that was as noble and decent as Governor Harry Hughes. He, uh, we've had great governors since then. I'm, I'm not in any way uh, demeaning them. But uh, he was a special person. Uh, the kind of fellow that you sat down and you talked with, and we told you something. Uh, that's the way it was. That was there was no uh, no pullback, and uh, he was so instrumental in my success because we did become very good friends. We are to this day very good friends. Um, I call him every Christmas, you know, if I don't get to see him, and uh, the age factors uh, taking a hold on both of us. But uh, we still we still enjoy and have uh, uh, reciprocal admiration for each other because uh, he did the kind of things that I like to see people in government do, and he was a kind of a person that uh, that you could depend on, 
no, uh, no shifting sand with Harry Hughes. What you saw is what you got. He became governor, uh, actually, uh, because uh, he failed to uh, be obedient to uh, the governor at that time. Uh, there was a contract, and this was public information. There was a contract, and he was instructed to uh, award that contract. He, being Governor Hughes, was instructed to award that contract by the governor at that time to a person whose bid was much higher than the one that he awarded to. And before he would do that, he resigned. And, uh, and that really is what kind of stimulated him to seek uh, public office. Nobody thought he had a chance in the world of winning it, but it turned out he, he was very successful. He was a great leader. And uh, we could always depend on him. When he, was, uh, when he was Secretary of Transportation, you could depend on him, but when he was Governor of the State of Maryland, uh, he was just such a big help in working with him and uh, helping to move things that needed to be moved. He was right there with us. Uh, he's a uh, sort of irreplaceable Harry, I guess you call him. <laughs> he was uh, the one who appointed me to the uh, Board of Education, both at the local level and state level. So my citations that I have at home and as Governor Hughes' name at the bottom. Uh, but the other thing that was going on is that and you found time to do this. And I realized that you were taking Calvert, leading Calvert County through a transition at the, during the 70s. But you found time to also connect with the state association. You did that as a school board member, and you also did that as a uh, county commissioner. You uh, participated and you were active at the Maryland Association of Counties. And in 1975, you became president. Now, you had a lot to do down here. Tell me about the, why it was important for you to make that connection and the leadership that we saw here in Calvert County, you also demonstrated at, at Mako. Actually, uh, serving and serving in uh, a number of roles in the, in the state and the county here, but uh, the uh, service that I had with the Maryland Association of Counties, uh, I don't think I had any particular desire to become a, an officer, but I was asked to. The executive director at that time, his name was Joseph Murnane, and he was a wonderful leader. And he's the one who pulled me aside one time and he said, uh, he said, you know, uh, Bernie said, you, you, have some, you have some leadership qualities and we really need people who step up the plate said, how about getting in line as an officer in the Maryland Association of Counties? I'd like to see you lead the association someday. So uh, that was the reason that I got started in it, but it was also another way to make connections with all the local government throughout the state of Maryland. And uh, I didn't anticipate at that time of going to the Senate. I just didn't, uh, you know, the reapportionment changed my mind on that, but uh, it, it, was a, it was a time that really helped to shape uh, the kind of things that I needed to get things done for Carver County statewide. And many of those people that I served with in local government, uh, later on I served with in Annapolis, so we had, we had strong connection. And, uh, I was very fortunate, I've been very fortunate all my life, very blessed to have had the opportunity to do that because uh, there was nothing in it nor did I want anything out of it other than the satisfaction of knowing that I was doing the right thing. And uh, you could say that in a hurry, but it's so important, just do what's right. That's, that's what's important in this life. And uh, that's... Uh, that, I guess, is the, is the product or the reward that I got out of serving with the Maryland Association of Counties. You became a, a household name throughout the state, and you were able to talk with people of all uh, walks of life, 
And uh, that was a big, big asset for me. And I recall uh, when I uh, when I left the uh, when I left the county after 12 years, uh, I felt we were in pretty good shape. We had we had uh, brought in three recreational parks. We had uh, a new hospital. We had uh, put the uh, the sheriff's department in police cars, marked police cars. And the list goes on and on, but uh, all of those things happened were for the betterment of the people that lived in this county and for those who were uh, choosing to live here. Uh, it, uh, it's just been a wonderful experience for me and uh, the journey has been, has been long and sometimes it's been very challenging, but uh, the reward for uh, being a small part of uh, bringing the county to the forefront where it belonged and providing uh, as best we could those things that were uh, exceedingly necessary to uh, make Colbert the wonderful place that it is to live. And you, I know you know this, but you were the first um, NACO president from Cowboy County. I think I was the first Mako president, if I'm correct, in Southern Maryland. Yes. yes. In, 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 in the Tri-County area, yes. And that, that was uh, an honor that uh, I didn't necessarily feel I deserved, but it was one that, you know, history records it that way, and that's the way it is. But uh, it, was a, it was a joy serving and a, a great time for me to improve uh, on my ability and to uh, uh, hopefully try to set an example that uh, would be uh, an advantage and not a disadvantage to the people that are served. And you mentioned the reapportionment, the, the, the census of 1980, and um, the opportunity of, the opportunity it afforded you to, to seek office at the state level. Um, there are a lot of things happened during the time you were at the state level, from 1983 to 1994. Tell me about that transition. You were president of the uh, county commissioners. You probably could have been reelected two or three more times down here. Uh, you decided to make that transition to uh, the state level. I uh, I enjoyed all of my uh, my work as a board of education member and uh, as a county commissioner and as a uh, Maryland State Senator. And I also enjoyed the interim offices that I held, you know, with the Maryland Association Boards of Education and the Maryland Association of, of uh, Counties. Uh, all of those were, uh, were uh, elements to help me grow and to become the kind of person that I wanted to be. Uh, I am not a real staunch advocate of term limits. But for me, I thought it was appropriate. And I set 12 years as a maximum that I would serve in any one station. I figured I could be able, I should be able to get done in 12 years what I was capable of doing. I would exhaust my talent at that time and either move out of government or move up in government. And uh, the reapportionment afforded that opportunity for me. And uh, uh, that uh, didn't come without some strong encouragement from people like uh, uh, retired Judge uh, Tom Reimer, who's a dear friend. Uh, he was uh, in the House of Delegates at the time. And I kept after him, no, you're, you're, just, you're already up. Why don't you shift and run for the Senate? No, I want you to run for the Senate. So. The reapportionment uh, allowed that. We had uh, uh, Carver, Charles, and St. Mary's at that time. We had 50% of the population was in St. Mary's County. The other 50% was in Corbett County and Southern Anne Arundel County. And uh, if I'd have had the opportunity to pick geographical areas that would have been pleasing and, uh, and uh, a joy to me, they were the areas because I didn't know when I left Carver County, went in St. Mary's County, uh, 
I did the same thing with uh, Anne Arundel County, South Anne Arundel County. I was, I was a part of the family up there. Uh, so we ran, we ran for the office of Senate and was successively elected, uh, uh, one in the primary and one very handily in the general election. And there again, I had set my target for 12 years. I think I could have been reelected uh, for a fourth term, but I made it uh, one year in advance. I made the announcement at the Carver County Courthouse that uh, I had served my time and that I was not going to, uh, I was not going to retire from activities, but I was going to retire from the Senate. And I wanted to do that to get everybody a chance to go ahead and run if they wanted for the seat. Uh, those 12 years uh, in the Senate were, were quite an experience for me. And uh, from an environmental standpoint, one of the things that I remember so succinctly was that uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to see some environmental education taught in the schools. And uh, at that time, it was very, very limited. It might have been a school here and there in a state where a teacher had a, a real affection or, or desire for the environment. And they, on their own volition, would teach kids a little bit about the Patuxent River, the Chesapeake Bay. But I wanted something more comprehensive than that. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the important bills that I introduced uh, while I was up there was to uh, mandate environmental education K-12 through in all public schools in the state of Maryland. It passed the Senate very handily. And, uh, uh, had, in fact, it had about 24, 25 sponsors on the bill with me. And then it got over in the House, and the, uh, the House of Delegates, the, the Environmental Matters Committee at that time, had a ruling that if, if you, uh, uh, they would not, they had an ironclad rule that they would not mandate education in the state of Maryland. That was a job for the State Board of Education. And regretfully, the chairman talked to me, had a very serious conversation, a lovely lady. And she said, then if there's anything I can do to help you, I will. But I can tell you, your bill is not going to come out of the house. Your bill is going to die in the house. It's not going. We just cannot break that covenant. We agreed that we would not mandate education in the state of Maryland, and we will not. And as much as I'd love to help you, I can't do it. So. What's plan two then uh, on that particular bill? And uh, it reached a point where I got to thinking, well, you know, uh, my good friend, Wilson Perrin, <laughs> is a member of the State Board of Education now. At least I have one friendly face up there. And I knew Dr. Hornback very well. He came to the Budget Taxation Committee all the time, you know, how they come in for the budget. And we got to know each other pretty well. So uh, the next plan was to uh, lock on with a dear friend of mine, Senator Joe Weingrad, great environmentalist, and he agreed to go up with me and to the hearing. So we made the appointment and came up, and uh, I remember, uh, I'll always remember that, that smile you had on your face when I walked in there, and you still have it today. Uh, as a result of that hearing that day and our proposal, we were able to, uh, I got a phone call not too long after that, just a few weeks after that, uh, Dr. Hornback told me that the State Board of Education had agreed. He didn't tell me unanimously, but I understand it was unanimous, that uh, they had agreed to, uh, uh, through uh, a decree or whatever, they were going to put uh, environmental education in every classroom in the state of Maryland, K through 12, in all public schools, and uh, today it's up and running, and uh, I just get a joy out of talking with the kids in the school. I do wait-ins with them, and uh, it's a uh, it's a real it's a real uh, uh, good feeling that you have when you look back over that and see the lives that you've had a little opportunity to to uh, influence and to see how they grab, they can talk to Chesapeake Bay, they can tell you there's 64,000 square miles of, of, uh, of watershed in Chesapeake Bay, they can tell you the state's involved, they can tell you about submerged aquatic vegetation. I know when I first got started on that, uh, 
I couldn't spell unification, you know. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And uh, the uh, folks at Chesapeake Biological Lab were the ones that helped me out and uh, got me rolling on that. But that's, that's for another time, I guess. But anyway, uh, I appreciated the time that I was in the Senate. We had the uh, mandatory wastewater treatment bill that went in that uh, uh, actually mandated uh, that uh, the 10 major plants meet certain standards by certain dates. And if it didn't, fines kicked in. It charged them so much a pound for nitrogen, so much a pound for phosphorus over the, over the level uh, the TMDL that we had set for those plants. And uh, uh, Governor Harry Hughes, I go back to him because uh, the federal government at that time was not convinced that uh, uh, nitrogen was a factor. They had done a study, it was called the Hydroqual study, and uh, it was supposed to be a, a very exact, science was supposed to be the, the exact thing that uh, was going on. But they came back with a report, and it was a Professor Brown who was in charge of that, and he said that uh, nitrogen was not a problem in the Patuxent River. Phosphorus was, but not nitrogen. So the federal government drew back. They said nitrogen is not a problem, according to the study. We won't participate in, in the funding, and that was a big chunk of money. It took $29 million to take the nitrogen out of Western Branch which is uh, probably the largest plant on the Patuxent River of the 10 major plants. There are probably 35 or more plants altogether, but the rest of them are below 500,000 gallons a day. And uh, so I, I mentioned that, that that's uh, long. We had the rockfish moratorium, which saved the rockfish. We had uh, uh, the uh, phosphate ban. Uh, some very important environmental issues, and also we had some good bills that that uh, that was very helpful to Carver County. Conry Museum is one that comes to mind. We were able to get a bond bill passed for one million dollars for them, and that gave them an opportunity to put up a new building. They were in the old school down there, so uh, lots of uh, lots of things that you get to. To uh, have a hands-on, uh, you know, uh, exercise with, and uh, you look back over your shoulder, and uh, you 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 kind of feel, in a humble way, proud of of, of those things that that occurred. I, I find that you started with the the board of education, you went to the county commissioners, you went to the state, but you made that connection with the need to improve education through the environmental curriculum that you put in place. Uh, at the time you were in the Senate, there were a lot of reports that came out on education at the time. If you remember, it was the children at risk, it was the accountability or a talk about uh, maintenance of effort. Uh, you, were, you were passionate about the, where we lived in, in, in the state, the water around us and, and we, the need to clean that up. And as you mentioned, you, you put in a bill, and uh, because of that structure of uh, not getting involved in, in setting curriculum by uh, the, the General Assembly, you didn't give up. You, you went to the state board, and uh, uh, you mentioned that that day, and I want to just mention too that it was, it was great to look out and see a, uh, a, a pleasant person bringing an issue that we need to address. Now, we as members of the state board knew that, uh, hey, we, this is a good idea. We need to move it forward. So it was easy uh, when you came in. I think the, the, the votes were already there. But we, we did the public hearings. We had to listen to you to, to tell us what we already knew that you were going to say because you were passionate about that. And thanks again for your leadership in that area. That is something that's in schools today uh, throughout the state and the, the importance of uh, our waterways and the environment to the success of, of our state and the future of our state. So I want to thank you for that. Well, I, I want to thank you for what you did because uh, your, uh, your smile that day when I walked in that room was assurance for me. And you know, you, you, you have that chemistry when you're doing things like this. I had a good feeling when I walked in the room that uh, 
he's a he's a good people, and I've got a I've got a, a cherished friend that I know is going to help uh, you know accelerate the support for this program. So very likely to help you make a difference there in environmental education. Yeah. Now in eighty three through ninety four, you you're in, in the Senate, and then you you left the Senate, and you ran for. Uh, you were on a ticket for one of the candidates going through the uh, primary for governor, lieutenant governor, with uh, American American Joe, I think. American Joe Benishevsky. Yes, and tell us about tell tell us about that experience of of running as as a candidate at the gubernatorial level. Well, I had, I really uh, when I retired from the Senate, I thought at that time that that was going to be the end of my political life, and I was very willing to accept that. But uh, a fellow by the name of American Joe Metashevsky from uh, Baltimore uh, came to me and he said, uh, I'm going to run for governor. And he said, uh, we have, uh, we've already filed, we have a committee set up, and uh, we keep talking about the second man, the lieutenant governor. And everybody's fingers pointing at Bernie Fowler, and so I'm I'm here to ask you if you'll if you'll consider serving as lieutenant governor. Well, what do I have to lose, <laughs> you know, it'll be it'll be another experience in my life. So we did that, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I recall I had a friend in the county here that uh, we really weren't close friends. He was much younger than I, but he had a plane of his own. And uh, he had it, uh, uh, I guess it was a little airport, a little airstrip up in Lower Marlboro. That's where he kept his plane. And uh, he came and volunteered to fly me anywhere in the state that I had to go to a, to a campaign. And uh, uh, I recall so vividly we, the first uh, opportunity I had to take him up on it was uh, the Taurus clam bake over in Crisfield. And uh, I went over there with no, uh, with no illusion that I was going to be, you know, greeted by everybody on the Eastern Shore. Although I had some good friends there, and still do. Uh, so we got in, the, uh, got in a little plane and uh, took my son with me. And we flew on over there. And uh, wherever I wanted to go, he would, uh, he would fly me there. So I wouldn't lose a lot of time on the highways, and uh, that was a great part of the campaign. Uh, we didn't have any money, and we got started so late, it was only six months or so before the election. Uh, the latest date that you could file, that's, that's when we filed. And uh, I, like I say, uh, getting that, and we had a pretty good field of candidates too. Uh, There's probably half a dozen running for it. But don't you know we finished up in second place? <laughs> that, that to me was success. That was an accomplishment. And uh, Crawford County carried me solid, uh, carried us solid, I should say, Joe and I. It was the only county in Maryland that we carried uh, like that. But uh, it was good to know that people at home here uh, hadn't forgotten Bernie and uh, that they, uh, they were willing to take a chance on me because I had a proven record here. Great experience that was. One of the things that happened when you were in the Senate happened during your sophomore year. And I'm not sure whether a lot of people know about this, but uh, you were chosen to recite the George Washington address that he delivered uh, in the old Senate chambers in 1783 when he resigned his commission as Commander in Chief of the Continental Army. Tell me a little bit about that, that honor and that experience. Well, in, in the Senate, they have a tradition every, uh, on George Washington's birthday, they always have a, they select a senator to uh, make a speech uh, about George Washington on that date. And they, uh, they uh, convene in the old Senate chambers, which incidentally is the oldest Senate chambers in the United States of America. That's where General Washington at that time resigned his commission. They have a uh, they have a symbol, a big star on the floor up there where he stood when he did that. And so uh, the tradition to have a senator 
you know, make a speech on George Washington's uh, birthday is quite an honor. If you think in terms of uh, the odds of that happening, there are 47 senators. You'd have to say that 47 years of each one had a chance to do it. And uh, you and I know that that's almost an impossibility. Uh, so I was very flattered and honored to, to do that. And uh, I always had some people that I could count on to do a little historical review and give me some outline, some notes to use. And uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was not an exceptional case. I, I always used good resources when I could. And so I, I made the speech, and uh, they tell me it was pretty good. And I had the pleasure of having my, my wife and was up with me and my grandson. And they sat with uh, the First Lady of the Senate, President of the Senate. They sat over in the window. When the uh, ledges are real wide, so they, they sat in those. And the, uh, uh, it was kind of fun, you know. It, when you stand up there uh, at that lectern, not too far from where George Washington stood, all of a sudden you, you get this feeling of this is really a part of history. Yeah. I mean, General George Washington, who became the first president of the United States, and here I am standing within a few feet of where he stood, actually uh, reciting some wonderful things uh, about his leadership and what he meant to the United States of America. So that was... Uh, that was uh, an experience that I shall never forget and one that I will greatly appreciate with a deep sense of humility for having the honor to do it. Yeah, I, I want to thank you for your service to, to Calvert County, to the state of Maryland. Uh, and I know what it takes when you, you're in public office and you've done it with strong leadership. You've created an environment in the state where even today, I know people come to you for advice in terms of what would you do if you were in that situation? And that demonstrates the leadership that you have and the wisdom that you have and your willingness to share that with, with others over the many years. So I, I want to thank you uh, for uh, this opportunity to sit and reflect on parts of your political career. and. Um, what, did I leave out anything in, in terms of my, my questions or comments? Oh, after you, after you, uh, you know, go back up to your deputy secretary station in Annapolis, uh, in your involvement, aren't you? Well, uh, hand over, yeah. Hand over, yeah. Uh, I'll think of a half a dozen things, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we, uh... Take notes and we'll... Yeah. We'll, we will get them. We'll get them, yeah. Yeah. But it, it's, uh, it's been my pleasure to, uh, to enjoy your friendship and your leadership, which uh, was very dominant for a long period of time and still is in the station you're currently in. You're, you're making powerful allies, and I guess in some places you should make a few enemies just like I did. Yes, yes. Just like I did yes, because I remember when we declared that moratorium on the subdivision of land in Crawford County. Names I'll not mention, but I had one man come in and shook his finger in my face. Didn't even ask the secretary if he'd come and just barge in my office. Said, you'll never live to get back in this office. You're ruining this county. You might as well put a wall up across Route 4 and stop people from coming here. Do you realize what you're doing to him? I said, yes, I do. I'm going to make millionaires out of all of you. You're buying land now for $50 an acre. Trust me. Yeah. See what it's like down the road, you know, a decade or two. Yeah. And uh, you and I, uh, you and I have a pretty good recall of the appreciation of land and the values in this county here. So, I appreciate uh, your, your mentorship and also uh, the role model that you set for. You set the bar high when it came to to political office and what what should be expected of someone that's a public servant. And uh, I try to live up to that. And uh, it was good to have that model out there. I, I, I recall when I first walked into the Mako office, and you know they have the, the, the pictures around the wall of all the presidents in, uh, of Mako, and I'm looking around and ah, I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and also appreciate when 
When I became president of MACO in 2009, and the dinner that we had over in um, uh, the Hyatt uh, in Cambridge, and you were there. Yes. You and your wife were there when, when I was being yes, so, uh, yeah. sworn yeah. in as president. Yeah. So I appreciate your support over the years, and uh, we all have benefited in Calvary County because we have a statesman like Bernie Fowler. Yeah. I'm flattered and honored, and uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am for uh, uh, you so graciously passing my way. It's meant a lot to me, and it will continue to mean a lot to me. And uh, I appreciate your time today, and I hope that out of this little gathering here, that when uh, the producer puts it all together, that it may, may just kind of resurrect some of the culture that you and I experienced when we were going through it. Uh, this United States of America is the greatest place on earth, but uh, to say that I'm totally pleased with the kind of culture we're experiencing now and some of the behavior patterns would be a ridiculously inaccurate statement. And uh, uh, so our work is still ongoing. Uh, Mr. Secretary, and uh, our challenges are still there as long as our great creator, our Heavenly Father, gives us the breath and keeps the old heart going and the brain working. Uh, there will be, always be an opportunity to do His work here on earth, and that's what we've tried to do. And I truly believe that uh, we're all put here for a reason, and our past have crossed for a reason. And I thank God that I've had that opportunity to spend some time with Bernie Fowler. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you very much.